Yes, we still shock people's brains. Today on this channel, I'm going to talk about electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, as it's also commonly called. It's one of the most controversial treatments in all of psychiatry. But to my surprise, and many others, it is still used today. So I'm going to be talking about just what ECT is, what's the history of ECT, and how is it done today. So without further ado, roll the intro. Something that stuck out to me when I first started researching this topic was that electroconvulsive therapy is usually reserved for those with severe treatment-resistant depression. But it's also used to treat bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and even catatonia and neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which is also a type of catatonia. And when is it used? It's used when medications just aren't cutting it. And whether you have depression or bipolar, hearing voices, etc., if the medication isn't cutting it, you can get ECT. So the origins of electroconvulsive therapy come from the idea that one disease can be used to treat another. One of the best examples of this is from the 1920s to the 1950s, people used malaria to treat neurosyphilis. When you're infected with malaria, you have a very high fever, and that fever was high enough to kill the bacteria that caused neurosyphilis, thus treating it. And this is kind of what happened with electroconvulsive therapy too. Basically, there was this guy who I can't pronounce his name properly, so I'm just gonna call him Maduna, even though this is his full name. He had a colleague that found that there were higher concentrations of something called microglia found in the brains of epileptic patients versus those with schizophrenia. And just so you know, microglia cells are known for getting rid of damaged neurons and helping with infection. So higher levels of them is a good thing. And when these microglia concentrations were compared to brains of schizophrenic patients, they found that schizophrenics had lower than average levels of microglia in their own brains. And But it wasn't just that. They also found that there was a lower level of schizophrenia in the population that had epilepsy. And there were even case studies that showed that schizophrenics who developed epilepsy after some time actually went into remission for their schizophrenic symptoms. And so the natural conclusion of this was to see if causing seizures would help cure schizophrenia. And a lot of this video is going to talk about schizophrenia because schizophrenia is what electroconvulsive therapy was originally done on. It was originally done on psychotic patients. And even though now, like I said before, it's used to treat a wide variety of conditions, mainly depression, this video is going to be talking about schizophrenia quite a lot because that's just what they did it on. And just so you know, this is the part of the video where things get scary before they get better. So I'm just giving you a heads up. Yeah. So Maduna started down his path in 1934 when he injected camphor into patients. And camphor was used because in animal experiments it successfully induced a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, and that was the target of Maduna's experiments, to induce a tonic-clonic generalized seizure in humans. And the thing is, when he injected the camphor in the patient, it still took a few minutes to kick in. And like, the papers I read, they basically said that it was very stressful for the patient. And I'm like, yeah, no crap, of course it's friggin' stressful. Like, if you were waiting to like have a seizure, you'd be stressed too. I mean, there were some papers that even told me that they had to chase the patients around the room just so that they could get the shot, which kind of is also horrifying as well. I mean, this whole situation is kind of horrifying, honestly. But anyway, so it took a few minutes to kick in and the patient was really, really freaking out. So this was, again, this is very early on when they were first developing it, I promise it gets better. But I mean, the reality of this is that a lot of these people didn't really have options, so this was their best chance at having a normal life. But I mean, if you're at your end of your rope and there's no treatment for drugs, I mean, I guess you'd try it too, right? I would, probably. But the thing is, the injections worked. The patient seized. In the next two years, Maduna, um, injected and treated over 100 patients, half of which either improved significantly or it improved entirely. So honestly, as barbaric as it was, the whole injection thing, stressful patient thing, the seizing thing, it actually worked. But as you can guess, the whole injection process, the way it went, the amount of stress it caused the patient, it was considered it, it could be more humane, let's be real. So in 1938, two scientists decided that they were going to attempt to induce the same kind of seizure, but to do it with electricity. And this is where things start to be a little bit more about what you might know about ECT. And unfortunately, the patient was still awake in the moments leading up to the seizure, even with the electrical shock method. But it was no longer the, okay, inject them with something, have them freak out for four, five, six minutes, however long it took, and then have it happen. But 
it, it was better. It was an improvement. An improvement is what is important here. And the electrical shock method was also known for being more reliable than the injection method, which I haven't mentioned at this point, but it's a chemical induction of a seizure. That's what the camphor injection was, while this is an electrical induction of a seizure. And the thing is, sometimes the injections wouldn't work, like the patient wouldn't seize. But with the electrical method, they always seized. And in 1944, the duration of the shock was reduced as much as they could to still get the seizure. And in 1952, they started knocking people out for the procedure and giving them muscle relaxants to avoid injury from the convulsions. And that's kind of where we are today, decades and decades later. You get knocked out, you get a muscle relaxant, they do the thing, you wake up, do it eight, nine, ten times, or however long it takes, and then you're fine. And I know that this might be still a little bit horrifying that we still do this, but again, it works. And one of the most important things to remember about this was that when it came about, there really weren't treatments for mental health at the time. Like antipsychotics didn't come out until the 50s, many other drugs. I mean, honestly, if you guys are taking any psychiatric drugs, they probably came about after the 1970s. I know that some of the earlier antipsychotics came out in the 50s. Um, I don't remember when antidepressants came about, but it, it was an interesting time because there were a lot of people that didn't have other options, and when they did ECT, it worked for them. And because of the wide success of it, it's actually used all over the world today. And it's not necessarily the modified version. People are sometimes still awake in other countries when they do this, but still better than the camphor injections in my, uh, my opinion. And you guys might know of Carrie Fisher, who played Leia in Star Wars. And she actually had electroconvulsive therapy uh, treatments and they worked for her. It kind of makes me think of like a brain reboot or brain reset, something like that. Like you basically just turn it off and turn it back on again. And that's kind of like, that's the kind of the vibe I get from it. And at the end of the day, I wish I could tell you how it works, but we just know it works. And that's the thing about a lot of mental health treatments as well. Like most of the medications I take, psychiatric meds I'm referring to, we don't really know how they work, we just know they they do. And that's not just mental health, that's other fields of medicine too, but I know for sure it's in mental health treatment. But I briefly wanna go over what exactly happens when you undergo ECT. And I'm not a doctor, I just have a Bachelor of Arts degree in biology, I'm not a doctor, but I found a paper that kind of described the, uh, the process of it from one perspective, and I wanna share that with you guys. So I'm gonna go through what actually happens. It should be short, shouldn't be too crazy long, but I hope you enjoy. So the first thing they gotta do is knock you out. So they give you a form of general anesthesia, usually methohexatol because there are other drugs like propofol that have an effect on seizure duration, and you really don't wanna mess with the seizure at all when it comes to medication interactions. And this is where it's really interesting. They give a muscle relaxant to the patient, but they first put a blood pressure cuff on their ankle to keep the muscle relaxant from getting there. And this makes sense because when the patient starts seizing, the muscle relaxant will calm it down and it won't like they won't be convulsing, but the foot will still be twitching so they'll know if the seizure is happening or not. And vital signs such as EKGs and ECGs are monitored the entire time throughout the whole procedure, in addition to blood pressure, heart rate, and pulse oximetry. And then they have two electrodes. They're not the they're not the paddles that you see in the movies or anything anymore. They're actually little gel um, little gel pad things. So they'd stick on either side of your temples for bilateral electroconvulsive therapy, or both would be on one side for unilateral electroconvulsive therapy. The important point is that they stay up here because they want the electricity traveling from one to the other through the brain, not through the heart, because the heart is also an electrical thing and we don't wanna mess with the heart. The next bit is a trial and error process. So they basically are targeting to have a seizure that lasts over 30 seconds. And it does take a little bit to figure out just what the seizure threshold is for every patient. And of course they start small, they don't just go zero to 60 in 3.5 seconds with this stuff. And they're all brief pulses or ultra brief pulses, which means they're fraction of milliseconds, so not very long at all. But they slowly increase it until they get that, um, they get that golden over 30 second seizure mark. And you might wonder, Kit, what happens if the seizure lasts too long? They're targeting 30 seconds or more, but how long is too long? And it's really, it comes down to, um, from what I understand, if it's over, if it's going over like in the minute, minute and a half mark, that kind of thing, they'll give a benzodiazepine um, or another drug to halt the seizure and that calms it down. And what's really interesting is the more you get treated with electroconvulsive therapy, you sometimes develop a tolerance to the shock, so they have to shock you a little bit more intensely to get over that seizure threshold. And I want to reiterate and expand on how we do not know how ECT works, but we do know, we do know 
that it affects dopamine and serotonin. Serotonin obviously is a big thing in mood, and dopamine also as well, but there's also uh, research coming out that dopamine is a major neurotransmitter involved in schizophrenic symptoms, so like psychosis is a dopamine thing, they think. I mean, there's this whole thing called the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia, which is not a theory, it's a hypothesis. It's just a few associations. I'll, ma I'll make a video about that. I won't, I won't go into that here. Um, but they know it affects dopamine and serotonin. And they also think that ECT um, helps reduce inflammation, which can also help stabilize mood states and whatnot but really other than that we don't know we don't know too much about it oh and uh, one last thing there is a brief hypertensive state meaning the blood pressure goes up during the seizure and because of this higher blood pressure uh, it could potentially cause things in your body to cross the blood brain barrier um, when they wouldn't normally because of that higher pressure anyway that's all for this video i'll see you guys in the next one